<clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this for the invitation. It's my first first time in Brno. And uh, thank you very much for such a kind introduction. So uh, what I am talking, what I am going to talk about is the phase transition phenomena, and probably uh, everybody knows what is a phase transition. So, so this notion comes from physics, and uh, and uh, the phase transition uh, occurs when uh, a small change of the parameter results in the fundamental change of the structure. So for instance, uh, this is a sort of uh, classical standard example is water. If we change the temperature of the water from 15 centigrade to 5 centigrade, nothing happens. When we change it from uh, plus 1 centigrade to minus 1 centigrade, uh, the fluid uh, becomes a solid. So, so uh, that's, that's quite, uh, quite surprising. So I just found in the internet, I just, just Google the phase transition phenomena, and this was the first, the first uh, 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 two hits which I got. So the phase transition comes from physics, and usually the, the standard model of phase transition use, uh, is using graphs. So let me just uh, tell you something about graphs. What is a graph? It's a pair of, uh, we, uh, the, it's a pair of two sets. One set is the set of vertices. The other set is a set of edges. And edges are just pairs of vertices. So um, typically, we draw this graph in a sort of standard way. So vertices are points on the plane, usually. And the edges are represented by lines, line segments. So this is an example of a graph, which uh, you, can, uh, you can see in uh, every, every textbook. And this is. This is a graph on uh, five vertices. This is a graph on 50 vertices. So it's just to show you, usually this, this kind of drawing is not in the textbook. But with, this is the object we are, we are working with. So I, uh, work, uh, I'm working, I, I've been working with, uh, with graphs for, for a long time. So, so this is, this is uh, what we are dealing with. So uh, now. Uh, let's back, go back to the phase transition. So this, uh, this graph, apparently, you can visualize it. So let's, try to, uh, let's uh, start with the square lattice. And what we will do, we will uh, uh, accommodate to this model a probability. So basically, for every edge of this graph, we leave it with probability p, and we delete it with probability 1 minus p, independently for each edge, and p is the parameter. So basically, what we do, what we get is the following. So, so here is, a, here is a, 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 what, what remained from this graph. And we are interested mainly in the size of the cluster. Cluster or component of the graph is the chunk of the graph such that from one, from one vertex, you can go to the other vertex. So, so here you, you see the component of six vertices. Here is a, there is a component of one vertex, and so on, so on. And furthermore, uh, we would like just to look at this graph uh, uh, from a distance. So basically, we try to make this. Uh, we, we try to make this. Uh, 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 this square lattice uh, very large, and we are trying to look at the distance and try to grasp what we can say about the clusters, which, uh, which appears in this percolation model when p changes from 0 to 1. So here what we, what we can observe. So, so first, uh, I'm not quite sure whether it's visible, so I just color each cluster with different colors. So if you just think about the water, there are some sort of very, there are many small crystals of the water. And if the temperature drops down, the crystals become the large chunk of ice. And at, at, at the very end, this is a sort of the, 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 the great chunk, the great piece of ice, ice at the very end. But uh, to see how the size of the cluster changes, Let's, uh, let's look at the size of the largest cluster. And, oh, sorry. 
And, uh, and here the clusters are very small. When this P is very small, it grows and then it becomes very large. So we, we say there is a percolation because, because the cluster joins one, one edge of the square to the other. And at the very end, basically the whole, the whole, uh, the whole lattice become uh, one large component. Of course, there are some sort of small components maybe in this, in this hole. It looks like a Swiss cheese. So if you look at this, uh, at this picture, well, maybe at first sight uh, it seems that they are very interesting, but how long you can stare at this picture? So it seems that it is not a very challenging mathematical problem, but it is. So, so there are at least three Fields medals which were awarded for the work on this percolation. So here are this, here this uh, here are the three medalists. So first, uh, Wendelin Werner got it in 2006 for the work which was a continuation of, of his work with Odette Schramm and uh, Greg Lauer. And uh, what he studied is the sort of the size of the boundary of the cluster. And the size of the boundary of the cluster is given by some sort of Brownian motion. So then Stanislav Smirnov uh, got it uh, uh, in 2004, in 2010. And basically what he did is uh, he was uh, studied a conformal mapping. So he proved that if we change this lattice a little bit, or maybe we replace square lattice by hexagonal lattice, basically the behavior of this percolation will not change. And finally, Igor Dominini Copin did it for the, did some work in the dimensions three and four. So basically, this, the first two guys uh, were dealing only with the square lattice, two-dimensional square lattice. Uh, then we, we went uh, uh, at least uh, one or two dimensions higher. And he got it recently in 2022. But at this moment, let me, let me uh, make two side remarks. So the first uh, side remark is the following. So as I told you, the Smirnov and, and Werner proved something, and it was not about graphs. It was something about some sort of continuous objects. So it turns out that uh, there is a way that we replace graphs by graph limits and got a, some sort of continuous object we can, we can deal with. And uh, in, in the same way as we can uh, uh, construct reals from, from, uh, from rational numbers that are taking limits. So we can do it with graphs. And the, 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 the reason why I mention it is that uh, for instance, for dense graphs, we know how to do it. And uh, in, in dense graphs, these limit objects are graphons. And here at uh, Masaryk University, there is a very strong group which are dealing with graphons, probably one of the best, best in the field. So this is the first, first uh, side remark. The second side remark is not maybe so mathematical, but it is related. So uh, I mentioned Smirnov. And I mentioned the Fields medalist, this, this ego, the last Fields medalist. So as you, as you probably know, the, the last uh, International Congress of Mathematics, which is uh, the, the largest event in mathematical life. So this is a big conference when we give all the prizes, uh, was supposed to take place in St. Petersburg. And uh, when the war started, at, uh, it was canceled, so it was moved to, to be virtual, and the field ceremony was moved to, the, to Helsinki. But there were, there were a bunch of uh, Russian ma mathematicians who were working on this Congress. And uh, very soon after the war, he, they issued the following statement. And I think it's, uh, it's maybe not so well known. So this statement was. Uh, was uh, announced uh, in, I think, February 27. 
So nobody knew. Nobody knew at that time that this, this wall would be so cruel and bloody. And if you just look at the, at the very, very last sentence, it's unfortunately it's like a prophecy. So, uh, of course, Okunkov, this, this four mathematicians who are who, Russian mathematicians who are in the, in the organization committee of the Congress were all working in the West, so they were not in Russia at that time. But let's go back to, to our subject. So there is one man which, uh, which is a key figure of this, uh, of this talk, which is Paul Erdes. Paul Erdes was uh, one of the most important and certainly by far the most influential combinatorialist of 20th century. And uh, it was, he was an iconic, iconic figure, so I, I was trying to, to, to find uh, a photo of him, but because before I, met, I, I just put the photo of this Fields medalist, so I decided to put this one. So here is uh, Paul Erdes, who is a Fields medalist, Terry Tao. And uh, Paul Erdes also, uh, is the author of the, so, so Paul Erdős is, uh, as, as I mentioned, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the greatest probably combinatorist of 20th century. He wrote nearly uh, 1,500 papers and uh, with uh, more than 500 co-authors. But his most quoted paper is about, is the paper with uh, Alfred Rennie on the evolution of random graphs. And it was published in 1960. And it has, uh, as you see, almost 800 citations. This is the beginning of this, of this paper. And this paper is about a similar model. So why the percolation model is so hard to deal with? Because it combines uh, combinatorics, probability theory, and the geometry. So it will be easier if we get rid of one of them. So the, be, the, the easiest way to get rid of is geometry. So instead of, uh, of working with ge geometri geometrical graphs, uh, he worked with something which is called the mean field approximation, what physicists would call mean field approximation of these graphs. So he just get, got rid of the, of the geometry. So here is his model. So, uh, from now on, we, we will be wor working with the, with the graph GNP, and GNP is a random graph on N, uh, uh, with vertex set uh, 1 to N, in which for each pair we just, uh, we just put the edge with probability P, and, and uh, we, we don't join two with probability 1 minus P independently for each pair. So there is no geometry here. But uh, let me just tell you that physicists believe that if the dimension of the model is high enough, so we remember, Smirnov and Werner got dimension two, and uh, the, 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 the last uh, Fields medalist got the dimension three and four, and, uh, but it's believed that the dimension is high enough, like more than six, or maybe like more than 32 or 15, uh, then, the behavior of this mean field, the mean field model is very similar to what, what we observe uh, in these geometric models. And there is a definition of GNM, so there is a second random model, and this is, this is a graph which is chosen at random from the family of all graphs with vertex, with n vertices and uh, capital N edges. And this, this basically what was, was Erdős and Rennie, the, denoted it by gamma and n. And strange thing is that uh, this model, GNP, is, uh, is always called erdos rennie model. They never use this model in a single paper. They always use this, the other one. But, uh, but these two models are sort of equivalent in a sort of precise sense. So if the number of edges is roughly the same as the expectation of the number of edges in the first model, these models are equivalent. And furthermore, there is an important, uh, important remark that this GNN, you can view this GNN as a stage of a Markov chain. 
So instead of choosing this n this 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 n uh, n edges at random in a graph, we can add these edges one by one. So we can add the first edge, and then we add random second edge, and so on. And the result after n steps will be this graph GNM. So in particular, this GN, if n1 is smaller than n2, we can consider this random graph GN n1, uh, n1 as a subgraph of GN n2. Well, it seems obvious, but this is a kind of statement which is so to speak, easier to prove than to explain what does it mean. Remember, this is a family of graphs with a measure in it, and this is another family of graphs with a measure in it. So to explain what does it mean, it needs a while, but, but we can prove it very easily. So anyhow, so, and, this, and the same is true for, uh, for GNP, sorry. So there is a first typo, I'll notice it should be GNP. So for the family of GNP, we can also find a coupling of these two probability space, so, uh, which can be interpreted in this following way. So that GNP1 is, is, uh, is uh, included in GNP2, provided P1 is, is uh, not larger than P2. And last remark is that we will be interested in, in the case when n is finite but very large. So we are interested in typical properties of this GNP. So if P is some function, so uh, given function, we say that GNP has some property asymptotic almost surely. If the probability of this property tends to 1 as n tends to infinity, and as a matter of fact, I will always uh, omit this asymptotically almost surely because it's... So if I said the random graph has this property, it means that it has this property with probability which is close to one. Okay, so here is the phase transition which was described by Erdős and Reni. So this is what they say. So they say the following, take n equals cn, and suppose that n over n it tends to, so suppose that it's not equal, but it's around c, so so this, this ratio tends to a constant. So they say there are only three possibilities. Either the largest component is of the order log n, when c is smaller than one half, or it's, a, it's of the order n to two thirds, or it's, a, it's, it's of the order n. OK, so that's what they claim. And if you think for a moment, it's impossible. So you see, we can add edges one by one. So at some point, the largest component might be of the order log square, uh, n to 3 fourths. Because if you join two components adding edge, the, the size of the largest component can only go, go up by the factor of 2. So something is wrong here. But anyhow, so, so, the, so this is a problem. So when, C, when this, uh, this ratio goes to 1 half, it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be that it go to 1 half. It should be that it's equal to 1 half. And that's, that's actually what they proved. So this was an unfortunate typo. So I was fortunate enough to work with Erdős for a long time, and I uh, we've been meeting for, for um, quite a few years. So sometimes I ask him, well, Paul, how, how was it possible? And he said, well, it was just a typo. But unfortunately, this typo was taken for granted by, by a huge amount of mathematicians. And it was noticed that it is impossible only after 20 years. So by the way, this this photo is probably the last, uh, the last photo of Erdős when he was alive. He was, uh, he was taken in a Thai restaurant in Warsaw, I think maybe three days after he died. So this is Paul Erdős, that's me, which was Ranga. This is Ehud Friedgut, Ehud Friedgut and Svante Jansson, and these two names uh, will pop up soon. 
So let me just uh, tell you what is the evolution of GN GNP and how the phase transition in this, in this graph looks like. So, so, so here what happens? So the evolution has these three, three phases. One is, one is subcritical. So in the subcritical, we have a huge amount of small components, and they are just compete with each other. So there are, there are quite, a few, quite a few leaders, and they compete with each other. They grow up, but they never are joined up. Uh, two leaders will never be joined by an edge until they, um, they grow up to n to two-third. If they grow up to n to two-third, then, well, then it's a sort of critical phase. And it is possible that this leader, these leaders will uh, merge into one giant component. So this is a very turbulent phase. So the size of the largest component certainly is not very well concentrated, since it may go up by two, by a factor of two even, when the two leaders will merge. And finally, at the very end, um, uh, there is this giant component, and this giant component will devour all the small components and will grow up. And the, all the other components are of the size much smaller than n to two thirds. So, uh, so oh, the, the largest component is also expander, very good expander, but let me not, not concentrate on it. So, so what we know about the phase transition is that we know that n to two third is a sort of critical size of components. Starting from that, the components uh, uh, will merge into one component, and furthermore, the width of the phase transition is also n to two thirds. So in the critical phase, if we add less than n to two thirds uh, edges, the structure of GNN will not be affected by that. So the question is, oh, by the way, we just uh, studied other critical phenomena near the phase transition. For instance, there is a symmetry rule. The symmetry rule is the following. If we just remove from the graph the largest component, the graph looks like uh, as it was in, in subcritical phase. And this rule was known for the epidemiologist uh, starting from the beginning of the century. So they know during the pandemic, which was at the beginning of 20th century, as you remember, that if we remove the large cluster, the structure of the pandemic will be like in the very beginning of the pandemic. But, uh, but we were able to, 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 to state it precisely. OK, so what I would like to do in the, next, uh, in the rest of the talk is to describe a similar phenomena in different types of the structure. And at the very end, I would like to uh, present some heuristic which explain uh, such a behavior. So how sharp the transition can be? So here the width was n to two thirds. So in the critical phase, we need to add at least n to two thirds edges to glue this small component into the one. Can can this, can this phase transition be sharper? And it turns out that it can be. For instance, if you just look at the largest subgraph, which has minimal degree k. So suppose that we are ju just looking at the subgraph with minimal degree 3. During this, this uh, process, there is always an edge such that if we add this edge, before adding this edge, there are no such subgraphs. And out of nothing, when we add this edge, there will be a huge, uh, huge, huge subgraph of, of order n which appears. So there is a phase transition which just needs one edge. So the question is whether we can do better, whether there is a phase transition that we add half of the edge, and it will go from small component to the larger one. It seems like a stupid question how you can add half of the edge. But there is a, such a model, and this is called the cluster model. So let me just uh, 
let me just uh, uh, explain what is this cluster uh, scaled model. So uh, I will go very quickly from this. So, so basically, we introduce another parameter, which is Q. And this cluster scaled model, I will, we will go through it uh, briefly. So, so um, this cast, the, if the parameter Q is 1, this, this model is, uh, is the same as GNP. But uh, when, the, when this parameter is, is, uh, is uh, not equal to 1, there is no coupling. So, so before, we can always assume that if P1 is smaller than P2, something like this happened. Remember, this was the reason why we said, well, this r dash Rennie result is not, re there must be something wrong with it. Here, this is not the case. There is no coupling like this. And let me just tell you what is the model. So this model can be, uh, uh, can be um, explained by, in the following way. So here is, uh, here is the clusters, cl here is the explaining how this cluster scaled model works. So, so we start with, uh, we just build a Markov chain. Oh, maybe I will use this one. We start with any graph. So this is an any graph on n vertices. And what we do, we color components by, uh, by random experiment if, with Q colors. So if there are two colors, so we, we just toss a coin for every component and we color it either red or blue. And if we do it, we just remove all the edges. So all vertices split into two parts. There are red vertices and there are blue vertices. So there are two types of, of particles and they cannot uh, red particles cannot interact with blue particles. So then we generate edges. But we generate edges only between red particles and only between blue particles. And here there are edges. And then this component may switch color. But always when the component switches color, they must switch for the all components. So for instance, the first one may switch to blue. And we just do it for every component, and then we remove edges, then there is, a, there is a partition of the edges, we do it again, blue graph, red graph, switching, and so on, so on. So this is a Markov chain, and this is an ergodic Markov chain, so it has a stationary distribution. This stationary distribution is just the graph GQCN. So the question is when, there is a large component in it. And when Q is larger than two, the large component is really strange because the only possibility of the largest component is either it's very small or it's very large. And the reason is that if you have few colors and there is a one large component in one color, so if we just color this component with red, there will be more red vertices than any other color. So there will be a higher probability that there will be a component in red. So for some P which is large enough, there is this huge component which has, which has roughly n vertices. For other, uh, if P is small enough, it's just, just log n. And uh, that's quite surprising. And what's more surprising is that to switch between these two faces, we need a really, really tiny change of P. This, this is really tiny. It's like switching a half of the edge. OK, so, so for Q equal, uh, when Q is smaller than 2, nothing interesting happens. So they are basically the same faces and when Q is equal 1. When Q, is equal, when Q is equal to, there is something which is sort of strange. Because in this model, this is a sort of critical value for this model, there are more faces than there are three. For instance, there is the supercritical phase. Uh, 
So the supercritical phase is sort of is when there is a large component uh, in one color, and uh, in, with this mechanism I explain you, this will force this color to be more frequent. So then, this, this component is so large, it will force the com the, this component with this color in the next round, but, uh, but there is something like every supercritical phase when there is a small comp this is the largest component, but this, this component is not so large to be larger than the random fluctuation of the colors. So this component, for instance, is not, is not uh, uh, um, uh, really, this size is not sharply concentrated because it follows from the random fluctuation. So even if there is a largest component in red, if we recolor these vertices, maybe the blue will have an advantage. Okay, so random planar graph, let me skip this part. So the random planar graph is basically like we would like to have this geometry embedded in the mean field model. So basically we just generate a graph like in mean field model, but we just discard everything what is not planar. And there are some sort of interesting, interesting phenomena here. But what I would like you to uh, what I uh, l like to do in the rest of the talk is to tell you something about random groups. So what is random group? Random group is much harder to, to generate than the random graph because group has a structure. So in uh, Gromov, Misha Gromov proposed to define random groups based on the presentation. So once again, let me just explain you what is the presentation of a group. So uh, we have a, an alphabet, letters A, B, C, and so on, and the inverse of the letters, and we uh, just look at the free group generated by these letters. So basically these are words, A, B minus one, A, C, and so on. And, this, and we compose this group by concatenation of the words. And of course, A minus one cancel with A, and so on. Uh, so examples, if we have such a, and, oh, okay, sorry. And, uh, and then we just give some sort of relators or relations. So these are words which we consider to be empty words. So we can put this in any place of the word or cross it in any place of the word. So for instance, if this relation is A, B, A minus one, B minus one, so this is equal to the, the neutral element. So it means that AB is equal to BA. Oh, here it's formally, I can put next to BA something which is one, because B minus one B, A minus one B. And then I replace the first one by E, so AB is equal to BA, and so on. And of course, if I put more relations, so for instance, I put uh, that A, this generator is rank three, and B is uh, rank two, then the group will consist just it will not be infinite group, so this is an abelian group with two generators, it will just consist of six elements and so on. So Gromov uh, proposed to define random group as a sort of, uh, in the following way, we just take a generator and take a random presentation of it. So we choose these words, which are equal to one at random. And there are a few versions of it. So Gromov proposed to have just two generators, but these relators are very, uh, the, the length of these relators grow. Zhuk proposed to have n generators and just take the relators of, of size three and so on. And, uh, and, and then we, we introduce the general model. But basically we will be working with this, work, with this model of Zhuk. So we have n generators and some relators, each of them is, uh, consists of three letters. So what is known? So uh, if we choose these relators with probability p, if p is very large, if p is large enough, then this group collapses to a trivial group. And if p is small, so there are not too many relators, 
it will be infinite and hyperbolic. Let me just skip what is hyperbolic loop. And uh, what, uh, what we prove is that we can replace the first one by a sort of better, uh, uh, by, by a better estimate. So if this p is larger than cn to minus 3 half, then this group is trivial. So as a matter of fact, I would like to prove it. So each mathematical thought must contain a proof. So let me try to prove it for you. So here is the proof. So we generate this generator in three rounds. So first, we, we, we just generate this probability p over 3, then in the second round, and then the thir third round, we generate another relators of length 3. So first, we split the set of these n generators in two roughly equal sets. So uh, one is n over 2 generators, and the other is n over 2 generators as well. And we define an auxiliary graph on the vertex set of the generators and inverse of the generators. So here is the auxiliary graph. So here are generators from the first group and in the inverse, and here is the generator of the other group. And uh, so now I define the auxiliary graph. So if I have two vertices, A and B, if I have these two relations, ACD and BCD, it will mean that A is equal to B. So if I have these two triangles, it means that A is equal to B. So I just put an edge between them. And suppose that P is so large that here we will have a large component which consists of more than half of these guys. So it means that everything which is inside, every generator which is inside are equal to each other. And furthermore, it, it, has, it con contains more than half of the vertices. There is a generator and there is an inverse of generator inside. So everything here is the same generator and is of rank two. Now we generate, uh, we generate this relation in the second stage and there must be a triangle here. So uh, this triangle means that if we have a generator here, it's of rank two and it's in of rank three at the same time. So all generators here must be one. And finally, in the third stage, it is easy to see, uh, you can easily prove that there is always, for every vertex here, there is a generator which has two other, uh, two other vertices in this component. So everything here must be, must be equal to the natural element. So this is the end of the proof. And basically, this large green component, if you just compute what is the probability of connecting it, it's like a C over N. So we can, we can really almost use erdos renyi result on the phase transition. Well, not quite, because these this, uh, edges are sort of positively correlated, but there is something which is uh, analog of erdos renyi for this in this particular case, which was bearish, and basically we can, uh, we can finish the proof because this was on, the only gap in the proof. So, so we prove this result. The first result, so now we would like to improve the second part, and that's not so easy. We cannot prove it. So the first result is okay, but the second result we can only conjecture that there is a constant such that if p is smaller than this constant, then, then indeed this GNP is infinitely hyperbolic. So we cannot prove it, but we can prove something else. So uh, together with Antoni and Friedgut, Friedgut was the other guy on the, on the picture, we can prove that there is something like phase transition. So there is a function of Cn such that if p is slightly larger than this function, then the proof is trivial. And if p is smaller than the function, this group is not trivial. So this is the phase transition. So it collapses. So the small changes of parameter just collapses this infinite group to the finite one. And, uh, 
And I would like to prove it as well. I'm not quite sure whether we can do it, but let's try to see it. So there are two types of thresholds phenomenon in a random structure. So the first phenomenon is like when we look when this GNP contains a triangle. So the probability that it contains a triangle is a sort of smooth function of the C. So it goes from 0 to 1. So when P is small, it, it's, uh, it's 0. And when C is small, and then it goes to, to 1 in a sort of smooth way. But for connectivity, there is a sharp threshold. So if P is C times log N times N, when C is smaller than 1, this graph is not connected. When C is, C is larger than 1, it is connected. So, so this is called coarse threshold, and this is sharp threshold. And we would like to prove that collapsing group is of this type. So here, we invoke the sort of general theory of sharp thresholds. And Friedgood and Bourgain prove that a property A as a coarse threshold only if it's local. If it's not local, it has a sharp threshold. So um, I would, uh, so this, is, this was first observed by, uh, anticipated by in the fa fa famous paper which is called KKL, the Kankalai Lineal, but uh, the final stuff was made by Bourgain and, and this addendum to this Bourgain article was written by so let me prove that the threshold for collapsing GNP is sharp. So it's not local. I didn't re really, I would like to prove it, but I didn't define what is local. Let me just do it during the proof. So to prove that it's not local, what we need to, to, to do is that if we add locally few relators, it will not affect the probability that it's collapsing more than if we change slightly the parameter p, which is global parameter. And here how it's, how it's done. So, so suppose that we add few edges somewhere. So if we, uh, if we add these few relators, so maybe there is a sort of finite set which becomes one. So this generator becomes one. So this is what we can do. So this is a small set. So how it affects the collapsibility of the whole group? So there might be some triangles like that. And if there is relators of this type, so it means that A is equal to B minus 1. Yes? So basically, we just, we just look at this auxiliary graph. This auxiliary graph means A is equal to B minus 1. So if we have it, so it means that, oh, oh sorry. So it, mean, it means that, that uh, there are few edges in the graph. But if we change, now we change P slightly, so this is a global graph. If we change P slightly and add some sort of few edges, then we can have this relators which are like this, A, C, D equal E, and B minus 1, C, D equal E. So it will mean that A is equal to B minus 1, as before. And uh, so we put the red edge over there. If we put the red edge over there, so it is easy to see that this red graph is much denser than this, this blue graph. Because the probability we put an edge is much larger than the probability we put, we, we put blue edge. And that's it. OK, so I think my time is almost up. So let me just mention that the, 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 this uh, phase transition phenomena is a subject which, uh, which is still very vivid. And we don't, don't well, we, we, at least for some models, we, uh, we do not understood it well. So for for this mean field model, which was started 60 years ago by Eldesh Reni, I think we, we have a sort of uh, good feeling and understanding of this model. For this, uh, for this random evolution of the random group, we are not. So for instance, there is 
property T or cash down property of the group, and we don't know what is the threshold for this property whatsoever. So there are a lot of open questions and, and conjectures, but because my time is almost over, so let me just give you two questions I am particularly interested in. So this is our, this is, uh, this is our statement. So you know this is, the CN is a function of N, unfortunately. So we would like to know that this is, that the CN really tends to a constant. We cannot really prove it, but uh, we would like to, to, to prove that the limit exists. So maybe the CN tends to, tends to zero, because we know that from our previous result that the limb sub of CN is, is bounded by a constant, but it might go to zero as well. So we don't know how to prove it. Uh, uh, Unfortunately, it's very hard to prove that the group is not trivial based on this presentation of the group. And the other thing is the following. So you remember with this k core, if we add one edge, this, this graph with minimal degree k will emerge out of nothing, and it's very large. Now we have an infinite group, so it would be really uh, uh, challenging task, and uh, as a matter of fact, it's important for the, for the group theory to know, suppose that we add these relators. It is the case when the group, that the group is infinite and we add one relator and it will collapse to trivial, uh, it will collapse to something which is finite, and only then it will collapse to trivial. And we don't know that as well. So with these two problems, I think uh, this is a good time to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you.